Hi right, guys. It is finally thinking about being an absolutely gorgeous day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the Point Lonesome Swamp deep in the oasis of freedom. It is now Saturday somewhere around February 18th or 19th. 2022 and the little dog and I have to get outside and start ripping down the outhouse. Yeah, so it is time for the outhouse to be ripped down and bundled up to move up to New York, baby. But before I uh, <laughs> dive into that <coughs> project, do what I do every day. Uh, well, every Saturday, or try to do, and that is bringing you one of my probably favorite rants of the week. This is our Hopium Roundup, our Apocaloptimism Hopium Roundup, where we look at all the various ways the little techno-utopians and reality deniers and the usual list of suspects talking about how we're going to turn this train around uh, here in the 11th hour and 59th minute. And finally, guys, all joking aside, finally, we have an article that I can get behind. We have some hopium that even your old Doomer can say hallelujah. Several of you have sent me this one. This was right here on Yahoo News also. Is eating people is eating people a solution to world hunger? The science behind Soylent Green. And uh, I'm thinking uh, that Soylent Green, which was filmed in 1973, took place in 2022 when uh, they came up with the idea to eat people to save the planet. Uh, so if you haven't seen Soylent Green, all right. <clears throat> the film was a stark commentary about the dangers of destroying our environment and the links to which some corporations could go to maintain profit. Now that we're actually in 2022, the world has seen an increase in novelty foods. The question now is, could we really make Soylent? And would we want to? Supposing, of course, we decided we wanted to transform our lost loved ones into food, we could definitely do it. The infrastructure already exists. After all, Humans are just meat, no different from any other animal at the end of the day. The easiest way to do it, but the least palatable, would be to treat humans the way we treat livestock. Establish a butchering process, package the cut meat, put it on the shelf. Job done. But we suspect that if we are going to eat people, we will want at least the illusion that we're eating something else. So let's think of other options. Yes, if you've ever looked at a seasoning packet, you've probably noticed they list chicken, beef, pork, or other meats as ingredients. Yet, when you look inside, all you'll find is powder. Where's the beef? It's in the powder, of course. And if we want to make a human biscuit, that is probably the way to go. <coughs> anyway, all sorts of ways to uh, eat people to uh, save the planet. I cannot, uh, and what I especially like, what they talk about later in the uh, article is one possible drawback is that we might be eating these things called prions, basically like the human version of mad cow disease. It's what killed my mother-in-law, by the way. My mother-in-law, I guess, was a cannibal. Uh, but what it's talking about is 
that we would be eating these things that get into our brain and kill us and actually eating humans could lead to the extinction of the human race. And so obviously we have something to be hopeful about is the extinction of the human race by eating the human race. But anyway guys, I have a lot of hopium to get to so uh, let's get back to the, uh, all right, it is time to go back to sleep. Book Hermit, we'll have to say Book Hermit told you so. We have a, uh, a, a ding for Book Hermit. Worst case climate predictions are no longer plausible. Worst case climate change scenarios with up to four degrees or even five degrees C of warming are no longer possible, a study has suggested, and I would probably agree with that, uh, that four or five degrees C is no longer possible, but that would be a reality roundup. This is a hopium roundup. Researchers at the University of Colorado at Boulder say that such scenarios are based on outdated data from 15 years ago and are no longer likely to happen. The study also found that the goal of the Paris Climate Agreement to limit warming to 2C is still within reach. <clears throat> yes, this is lead author Roger, Roger Pielke. Quote, this is cautiously optimistic. Don't you love that, how they always put the word cautiously before the word optimistic? This is cautiously optimistic good news with respect to where the world is today compared to where we thought we might be. The two degree target from Paris remains within reach. Yep, yep, yep. Anyway, then they break down how those uh, hopium-soaked apocalyptimists uh, come up to that ridiculous conclusion. So anyway, guys, this was actually on, on uh, oilprice.com but I held it off till Saturday, just so in case you're accusing me of making up this headline. BlackRock CEO, the energy transition will create 1,000 unicorns. All right, BlackRock is joining the uh, forces creating unicorns I looked to, here, I, I could not find any detailed information whether the energy transition will create 1,000 pink flying unicorns. I don't think they're going quite as far as claiming flying pink unicorns. These are probably just your basic white unicorns with no wings on them, but anyway, Look forward to 1,000 unicorns being part of the energy transition. Thank you, BlackRock. I'm not sure why this showed up, and uh, I will save this last one from BBC News. No silver bullet solutions for saving our used planet. I must have, I don't know how that ended up. We'll, we'll try to come back to a reality check. How did you get in here? Anyway, let's get back to non-reality. How to weaponize our dying oceans against climate change. All right, we're going to weaponize our dying oceans. Yes. The ocean covers more than 70% of the planet, and unfortunately, it is acidifying fast thanks to noxious carbon dioxide emissions spewed from industrial smokestacks, blah, blah, blah. 
roughly 22 million tons of carbon dioxide find their way into the ocean every day. The resulting acidification threatens countless marine species that are part of an ecosystem that humans rely on. Yes. But what if we could use the ocean to combat climate change and possibly even reverse this process? What if the ocean could be used as a trap for carbon dioxide, removing it from the climate change equation indefinitely? Yes. All right. Um, and then they talk briefly about carbon capture and storage, but uh, if you doubt that, uh, you will be thrilled to hear that last December, the National Academy of Sciences released a report that evaluated the feasibility of different proposals that instead focused on the role of the ocean in carbon capture. One of the plans referred to as ocean alkalinity enhancement. You know, the opposite of acidification is alkalinification. So that's just enhanced the alkalinity would involve grinding up igneous rocks that are found right on the shorelines around the world to make the oceans less acidic and more alkaline. Theoretically, that would not only address the ocean acidification problem and make the oceans healthier, but also allow ocean waters to absorb excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and prevent it from acting as a greenhouse gas. We're just going to pulverize those rocks right there on the ocean, rake them into the ocean. Ocean acidification problem solved. Grind up some rocks along the beach, rake them, you know, send them over there to the ocean, and go back to sleep. But if you think that grinding up rocks uh, to save the planet is only good for the ocean. Well, right here, rock dust used in agriculture can remove carbon dioxide. So what works for the ocean works for the land as well. It is not often that a positive parallel can be drawn between curbing greenhouse emissions and agriculture, but one solution maybe on the horizon. Let's start with the facts, however. Industrial scale farming is one of the biggest sources of pollution to the planet, according to a recently released New York Times video entitled, Meet the People Who Are Killing Our Planet. That would be any of us who eat. The people who are killing our planet are any of us who eat food. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, so they break this all down about how the planet is doomed, but according to Yale Environment 360, adding rock dust onto the soil can help get and trap carbon into the ground. A group of researchers from Cornell and the University of California are studying the effects of farms applying silicate basalt rocks pulverized to a fine powder to the soil to stop the massive emissions attributable to the farm industry. Yes, scientists across the globe are studying the effects of spreading pulverized rock on a number of crops, including corn, sugarcane, 
soybean and alfalfa, you go rock dust to save the planet. But of course, of all the people saving the planet from climate change, don't forget the single biggest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet, which is, of course, the United States military, the U.S. military pumping out more greenhouse gases than any other outfit on the planet. But don't worry, the U.S. Army has released a plan to address climate change. The U.S. Army unveiled a new strategy this week for dealing with global disruptions caused by climate change, which it says endangers national and economic security. Yes. Uh, so how is the U.S. Army going to save the planet from climate change? All right. Part of the Army plan includes making all military installations more self-sufficient in terms of energy and water needs, but it also calls for a sweeping, a sweeping transformation to sources of clean energy. <coughs> yes, switching to an all-electric fleet <coughs> of non combat vehicles by 2035, and for the development of electric combat vehicles by 2050. All right, in 30 years, we will not be using fossil fuels, you, you know, to uh, invade and uh, destroy a, another part of the planet. A list of immediate objectives contained in the report lists prioritize, such as providing 100% carbon pollution-free electricity for Army installa installations by 2030 and achieving a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from all Army buildings by 2032. There you go. The good folks at the U.S. Army saving the planet. So what is Chile doing? What are those uh, techno-utopians in Chile doing to save themselves from a calamitous future? Chile is making its own glaciers. All right. This article is an installment of Future Explored, a weekly guide to world-changing technology. All right. In recent years, mountain communities in Chile and all over the planet in recent years, mountain communities in Chile have been facing longer and more intense dry spells thanks in part to rapidly shrinking glaciers in the Andes. This puts serious stress on local communities that rely on the glaciers for fresh water. But a team of Chilean climate experts have come up with a solution. In 2022, they will attempt, they will attempt to do it yourself, their own glaciers. Yes, in hopes of supplying fresh water through the dry summer months. There you go. Just do it yourself. You know, if Mother Nature uh, is no longer making glaciers, just make your own damn glaciers. You know, it's just like me on uh, like tearing down these buildings. Uh, I got very overwhelmed and depressed by it, and my buddy comes over here with his damn 
screw gun in his sawzall and says, Sam, just tear your own buildings down. You know? Tear your own outhouse down. Make your own glacier. What's the difference? You know, I'm going to tear this outhouse down, then I'm going to go make my own glacier. Good for you in Chile. But let's see. All right. Did you realize that America is losing its superpower status to China? There is only one way we can get it back. All right, we are living at a critical juncture as the urgency of climate change demands that we cut back on fossil fuels. The costs of clean energy are plummeting. We have an opportunity now to course correct and go full speed ahead toward building our clean energy future. It makes sense for our economy, job security. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, so where? Let's see some specific examples. All right, here we go. This is how we can both save the planet from climate change and reclaim our rightful God-given position as the biggest superpower on the planet from China. All right. One, just one significant example of where we can innovate relates to American manufacturing. In order to meet our clean energy aspirations, we must strengthen our domestic manufacturing capabilities. That means building more of our own this is kind of like, you know, building your own glaciers. In Chile, here in America, that means build, building more of our own polysilicon wafers, solar cells and panels, racking and tracking products, as well as batteries, wind turbines, and other critical components. There you go. You can save a planet and save your soul from China by building more and more and more and more. The more of this crap we build, the more of the planet will be saved. But, uh,. Just one of the many people throwing on to save the planet. The fashion industry. This is how the fashion industry, uh, at least in New York, baby, will be saving the planet. New York bill enlists fashion industry in fight against climate change. Yes, New York is the widely recognized fashion capital of the United States. I'm sure... Uh, you can see why uh, this New York resident uh, is uh, certainly a, a poster child of the fashion industry. All right. New York is the widely recognized fashion capital of the United States, and it may soon use that influence to combat climate change. A bill which has been introduced in both houses of the state legislature, would require large clothing companies to disclose and reduce their environmental footprints. Yes. The Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act, for anyone who has read The Every by Dave Eggers, this is right out of that hilarious book about the sustainability movement. The Fashion Sustainability and Social Accountability Act, known as the Fashion Act for short, would force, would force clothing and apparel manufacturers with more than $100 million in annual sales 
to disclose on their websites the amount of energy, water, plastics, and other chemicals they use, as well as their emission levels of the greenhouse gases that cause climate change. It also contains standards to include fair labor practices. Yes, this requirement would be applied to the entire fashion supply chain, including the farms where the raw materials such as cotton are grown and the process of shipping those materials. And after disclosing this information, the companies would then be required to begin reducing their ecological footprint. As I say, this is directly uh, predicted in the, the every, all of these unadulterated, greenwashing, horseshit, uh, fashion sustainability and social accountability acts. You can look for these things rolling out you, you know, in, in freight trains full. But uh, we're going to wind up, I guess, as I say, I have no idea how this story from BBC News found its way into the Hopium Roundup, but let's see what this is all about. No silver bullet solutions for saving a used planet. With much of our planet already used up, the world has hard choices to make over how to use land in the most sustainable and effective way. That is the take-home message from 50 leading experts on why land matters in tackling a host of existential challenges. Vast areas of land are being earmarked for grand plans to fight climate change and nature loss. I guess that's why this ended up here. Yet, land is also needed for food production and alleviating poverty. The scientists say there is simply, there simply is not enough land on the planet to address all of these things at once. Well, there's two ways of saying this. The scientists say there simply isn't enough land on the planet to address all of these things at once, which is another way of saying the scientists say there are too many humans on the planet to address all of these things at once. That's two ways of saying the same thing. Quoting the report, we live on this used planet where all the land that is even considered unused or untouched is providing really important benefits to people, said Dr. Ariane de Bremen of the University of Bern. Quote, there is not enough land to do everything simultaneously. We have to recognize that and find better ways. Yes. We shall see. Uh, if you enjoyed this story, how about scientists uh, from the BBC, scientists address myths over tree planting Quick fixes to the climate crisis risk are harming nature and future-proofing forests for orangutans. Yes, future-proofing the forest for orangutans. There you go. I'm sure the orangutans are uh, cheering that on, but anyway, uh, I've got to wrap this up because the sun, the fog has rolled out, the sun is out, the swirlies are running around, and I have an outhouse 
to dismantle. Get out there and uh, dismantle your outhouse while you still can. Sancho Panza says, bye guys.